Welcome back to the Sports Booth Podcast. You are joined by myself, Luke Bowden, and my co-host, Husey. Husey, how are you? Uh, how, how's, how's everything going? A tough weekend, I must say, for, uh, yes. for you. Yeah, it's kind of uh, last weekend was a good weekend for me and a bad one for you. It's like the reverse <laughs> this weekend. Yeah. Um, one shining light for me was the NFL preseason. As you can see, both myself and Luke decked out in some <laughs> NFL gear here. Uh, for me, I'm wearing my the team I actually support stuff. But Luke, <laughs> as is his style, is wearing a kit from a team that he doesn't support uh, for whatever reason. It's you the know? Damien it's like talk- jumper, though, so... I don't yeah. know if it's going to show, so it's LT's jumper, so yeah, it's yeah, actually I cool. The, I can see the Tom. But, <laughs> I mean, for, for sure, I get it, but it's just like when we talk about the NRL, you always talk about the Warriors and the Raiders, um, but you never I've, I've, talk I've, about I've had a good reason coach. to do that actually, this season. I've had a good reason yeah, well, to do can, that this we can, season. We can talk about them we again. Can, We're back. We can talk back today. You've got a name again. The Gold Coast side is back. So, <laughs> it only took us yeah. 10 weeks. Yeah, well done on that. Uh, um, so we can call them by their name again. Um, not like the movie Call Me By Your Name. Totally totally different to, to that there I don't know if you know the plot of that movie but it's a lot of underage gay sex so oh no I, so, I so. <laughs> no I, I've never seen yep. it uh, okay but yeah. well you're not missing out <laughs> cheers mate um, yeah I mean again like Husey said the NFL is coming back into it both our teams got wins I am a Falcon fan but I rep I rep yep. good players that I love so um, we will talk a, a little bit about that later uh, but let's get into kind of the headlines of the week uh, obviously we follow heavily the oval balls in rugby rugby league and American football mm-hmm. and let's start with our rugby where my all blacks Came back uh, and and I guess silenced some of the haters, myself slightly included. Now I would say I've got proof that I'm not actually a hater, um, but they still let me down a little bit, and that's purely because I put fifty dollars on the All Blacks to win by fifteen plus, and they only just slightly let me down. But I was I was very confident of a big of a big win, and I thought this mm. was our our time to do it. I just had a feeling. I felt like there was a few things. Had gone right uh, throughout the week. I loved the team that Foster named, um, and I thought, you know what, this is this is it. This is the moment. Now they let me down slightly. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get upset. We talked about it pre New Zealand going over to South Africa. I would take a one one. I'm actually now disappointed mm-hmm. that we didn't take a two zero because I think if Fozzie actually knew how to name a team, we may actually have taken. Uh, a two zero, but I'll live with it. I will live with it. Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit of balance has been restored with New Zealand getting a win and Australia disappointing. <laughs> well, okay, I've got to stick up for for the Wallabies here. So for for those who whoever you are who haven't seen the score lines, it was uh, South Africa twenty three, New Zealand thirty five. Uh, living that series 1-1, and then Argentina 48, Australia 17, uh, leveling that series as well. Uh, and stick out for the Wallabies, I mean, has there been a more a recent example of a team that has gone through such an injury crisis on the, on the national level? Like, when you're without your top three hooking options, I think it was, it's pretty it's pretty dire for the Wallabies, you know. Um, without the captain Michael Hooper, uh, Quay Cooper ruptured his Achilles and everything like that. Like, it's just a a whole uh, struggle for the Wallabies across the board. Injuries everywhere. I think definitely the presence in the centres being missed of Karevi and Paisami was was definitely felt. Um, but I mean, Argentina played a hell of a game. They uh, very strongly announcing that their candidacy for, for, for winning this competition, and even against an undermanned Australian side. Like, that's an impressive victory, no doubt about it, an impressive victory. Um, and they, you know, it wasn't a decided game uh, by any means until sort of late uh, in the game because the Wallabies still had the opportunities, but uh, Los Pumas held on throughout and, and, and didn't allow the Wallabies any room to do anything. They, you know, I think... One of the things that's sort of underrated in sport is the ability to hold on to a lead, but also ex- extend the lead, you know? And it's not a skill a whole lot of teams learn until they become successful. Like Argentina has always been, you know, fourth string in the rugby championship to the big three. And so they've not had much experience playing with the lead and that puts a different kind of pressure on you. Like, don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. And it, it, it is a hard skill to, 
to master. And, you know, the Wallabies have fallen prey to when they've had leads over New Zealand, choking it away and things like that as well. So it's not an easy skill uh, to learn. And it is a vital one, though, if you want to be a champion. And I mean, yeah, perfect example last week. You know, up at half time, weren't able to finish the job. So, realistically, like we've said, you, you know, obviously disappointing to, to lose and to lose by such a number. But I think if you'd come away from Argentina with a 2 0, you would have been over the moon purely because yeah. I think they're moving in the right direction. Now, they got a lot of bounces of the ball go their way. Let's, let's not also mm. say that they had the perfect game. Um, kicks, stuff like that, uh, yes. go their way. So, I mean, as an Aussie, a lot of people were getting, you know, disappointed and angry about it. I actually see it as a massive positive, um, not the result, but the players that played. Billy Pollard is a star for a future, no doubt, as a, yeah. as a hooker. Uh, you see Fraser McWright getting more game time. You've, you've got a clear two tens, because in, in my opinion, James O'Connor is no longer a 10. Um as much as he may be for the Queensland Reds, I don't see it happening on the Wallaby stage. I would again guarantee Noah's going to be starting over him for the next game. I just can't see it happening after that performance. Um, and again, we can say, oh yeah, it wasn't wasn't the best, you know, backline outside of him. I I just think the combo he has with White isn't there. So they're going to go James O'Connor at ten. They've got to go Tate McDermott because that was just that was. Uh, I watched the whole game back uh, uh, the Sunday, and that was uh, yeah, it was just. Your half's playing like that, you're never going to get off a, a, a good chance to win the game, I think. So, so yeah, I mean, from those first, you know, four games, we've got Argentina at top, which I don't think many people would have picked, you know, even just yeah. with the, the points differential and everything uh, and the All Blacks only and South Africa splitting uh, their series and getting four points each. I must say, South Africa must be falling into the realm of Bledisloe Cup talk now. Now, obviously, the Bledisloe Cup is, is a bit more... You know, got a bit more value to it than the Freedom Cup. But I had to Google when was the last time South Africa won the Freedom Cup. If you had to ha- hazard a guess, now I've obviously built it up there like it's quite a while. What would you guess, my friend? I am going to say 2013. Wow, see, yeah. 2009 was the last time wow. that South Africa held the Freedom Cup, so won that's a series back. against, yeah. Really? I know. And it's, that's what that's what blurs these lines. Like, South Africa's always a great team, but they peak for World Cups. And this is what, again, yeah. Australia's probably still hasn't quite understood this yet because they've been, and, and rightfully so, you make an attempt every year to win the Blue so you have to. But I think that's part the glare because if you win a World Cup, that that glare of the Bledisloe Cup and not winning it, you know, dims a bit, a little bit more. It's not yep. so, it's not so hard to take. So you look back and you go, well, you know, obviously South Africa won it in two thousand seven, then two thousand nineteen as well. So you kind of go, man, there's a there's a lot there for South Africa in, in between drinks to to go. Well, actually, we won the twenty nineteen World Cup. The Reading Cup doesn't matter, and they get probably more percentage of wins. But yeah, I, I was just amazed to think that I was like, you know, if 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 they keep going like this and they're not able to, if we think about it, this is the worst that the All Blacks had been for a long time. You know, the the, the biggest crisis we probably had in a, in, a, in, a, in a long time and they weren't able to capitalise and make it 2-0. So interesting, very interesting. I must say, as a uh, New Zealander and a sports booth um, kind of content leader, we'll say that, uh I fucking hate both New Zealand All Blacks and South African fans. I must say that Jesus Christ, having to argue for both sides is the worst thing ever. We were quickly ripped to shreds over selecting Arm and now Sansa for uh, fifteen starting XV over when we picked uh, uh, Rico Ioani over him, and then I was quickly ripped to shreds uh, when I picked him over Oani in the form team of the week this week by all the New Zealand fans. I was ripped to shreds at the uh, the refs let South Africa win. I was like, you can't win with these lots. Whenever they play each other, it's no. always going to be someone's fault, and any decision you make's not great. So I'm getting quickly over having to, <laughs> to to fight back my points of view, but I'll keep doing it because that's what I do. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. Why, do you, why else do we have this podcast if not to inflict our views upon everyone else? Exactly. Uh, and, and, and we're always right, that, aren't we? <laughs> exactly right. We've never been wrong. That's why we are perfect in our tipping and everything like that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, sort of building off what you said about Australia and how it's a bit of a positive for them, I think it is a little bit as well. I hope what it means is that we could start to get some of these younger guys involved a little bit more because we need to recognise we can't rely on the old guard as much. Now, and I'm going to say this as a faithful New South Wales Waratah and Wallabies fan. Love the guy to death, Bernard Foley. 
I was really disappointed to see news reports this week that they're thinking about bringing him into the Wallabies camp. At some point, you just have to sort of move on, right? Yep. Now, he's playing in Japan, I believe. He hasn't been involved in the Wallabies since 2019. We've got a stable of young tens coming through, Ben Donaldson, Tane Edmed, and others from, from around the league as well. You need to. We need to sort of bring these young guys into the Wallaby system earlier. Not necessarily chuck them on the field, but bring them into the system, get them exposure to that international rugby, and and build them up and show them that we support them. Like the old guard, Bernard Foley was fantastic. Ten was probably my favorite player, favorite player while he was on the Waratahs, especially when he kicked that penalty to to win us the Super Rugby Championship. Like that was incredible. I was in the stands as with everyone else in the crowd. I was up and cheering at the time, going absolutely berserk. Like it was like something you see in a movie where strangers were like hugging each other and things like that as well. Like it was amazing. And he he's forever um, got a place in my heart for that. But people get older, as I know from first hand experience, looking at the the grain in my beard and things like that. Like people get older, we get past our get past our prime, and then it's time for the next generation to come in and give the team the best chance to win because. The best, the best thing that you could hope for as as a player is that the team continues after you're gone. That you set such a a level that it could, and you bring more people in that it keeps on going. Right? That's that's the thing. Uh, so I really think that I think I think you and I both have said that Tain Edmed is we think the future at ten for for Australia. Now next year's a World Cup year. It could potentially be his time there. You know, Quade Cooper's coming back off a ruptured Achilles in his thirties. Uh, superhuman as he may be, I don't even know if that would necessarily be the be- best option. Edmund with some more experience could be it because we've seen it from from New Zealand. A, a great 10 is necessary uh, to win. We saw it from Ireland as well with uh, Sexton. We've seen it with England, uh, with Marcus Smith. You need you need a good 10, right? And, and Edmund, I think, can provide some playmaking ability out of that role. It's just the experience that he needs a little bit more of. Um, so... I'd like to see them involved in the Wallabies, even just as part of the, the extended squad. doesn't even need to be on the bench, although that might be good to get them some, some bench time and then a couple of minutes at the end of the game and whatnot and have Noah as the primary primary 10. Um, and I think as well, it sort of is, is negative for, for Noah that he must be feeling, well, you know, I'm still here and they're looking at bringing someone in that hasn't been involved in the team in three years over me. And I, I played games against England and I wasn't awful, you know, like I didn't cost us games, you yeah. know. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think that for a player that is clearly, clearly he operates, his, his performance is affected by confidence, right? To show such a lack of faith in him cannot be great for his game. So 100%. yeah, I think rather than trying to reach out to ghosts of Wallaby's past, look to the future, look to the younger guys and, you know, the younger guys bring some excitement. They bring an element of risk in there as well. But you've got sometimes you've got to roll the dice. So Definitely. yeah, I'd like to see some of the younger guys get called into the squad. Um, and, and that's what you, we we saw it with with players uh, that made their debut for the Wallabies and and, and played well. You know, Nick Frost, um, Parecki, and like, things like that. Parecki's not a young guy for sure, but uh, you know, at some point you do have to give a chance uh, to these new guys and not just play the same players over and over and over again and hope to see different results out of them. Yeah, I mean that's a it's a perfect answer you've kind of given. I think it's it's what Quade Cooper's done. I think shouldn't be ever shadowed coming back from and Karevi and Kotobiti from Japan to play in a Wallaby setup. Like Japanese level rugby is not anywhere similar to Wallabies level rugby or even Super Rugby, and we're seeing it with Damien McKenzie mm. returning from Japan to play NPC, and he's playing ten, and I wouldn't say he's struggling, but he's not. The D- Damien McKenzie we all know, so I don't want it to be you know so like sold down the river about how hard that transition must be. And like you've said, he's been out yeah. of it for three years to come in. I think you're totally right. I think it's if you're ever going to be bringing in Tane Edmund, Ben Donaldson, players like that, you've got the guy who's got experience, who has his chance. You go to Noel Lolo, say, oh, this is your chance. You win us a bleeder slow. You'll probably be the team for a very long time. You don't. It's not the end of the world. We've got some more young guys yeah. who are going to push you to be the best you can be. So uh, I love that that little wrap up there. Shall we uh, move on to the NRL and uh, start with a bit, obviously, a bit of sad news with Paul Green mm. coming in. Um, I think it was when was it 
weekend, early weekend, Friday even maybe um, last week, uh, the the news I broke. I think it was Thursday. Thursday, yeah. And yeah. Um, just terrible news. And I know we talked about it last week pretty heavily, the mental battle of players. Um, and yeah. obviously he was a former, former great um, player and coach and just – yeah, just an absolutely terrible situation for everyone involved. Um, so sad for, for all involved in rugby league, every fan. I, I don't think, I think, you know, you first see those ones and you hope they're just kind of some some fake news. Someone's just doing this as a joke and then there's more and more, you know, outlets post it and you just start to realise they actually know this has happened and, and, and terribly sad news. Yeah, it just goes to show, um, again, the same... Uh, I guess, message that is put out there, which is you never really know what someone's going through. Um, The surface doesn't reflect what's um, inside and things like that. And that people at all levels of life and social interaction uh, are dealing uh, with things as well. So um, it it can happen to anyone and uh, the need to look out for each other is always there. And um, yeah, I think having... Uh, I think actually Nico Hines was one of the the voices that came out throughout this and said that, um, you know, we've got all these other weeks. He said sort of something like what I said, you know, we should have more of these representative weeks, including one that's mental health awareness and things like that. I know there is some um, representation in the league for Are You OK Day and things like that. I think maybe putting a more official label on it would be good. Uh, And and like I said as well, um, when when Brad Fittler came out and said, oh, we we have too many jersey variations you know i sort of revisited my thoughts on that and i don't necessarily disagree with him i I think his message was probably not the best delivered in that i think that there does need to be more representation i I disliked how he called it commercialization uh of of the league and of the players i mean it's a it's a product it's a business you've got to it is commercial like if you've got television rights and fans coming it is commercial but representation is what the what the message is there and, and you know I, I don't necessarily disagree with that i think yeah having all these different jerseys it, it, that it might cheapen the, the the message a little bit because you've got all these different looks now personally i do like to see a little bit of variation in the jerseys i think i'm very lucky in that the dragons have got an amazing uh, kit and, and color and everything like that so i quite enjoy seeing their different ones especially the indigenous jerseys i think those are absolutely fantastic those are some of my favorite jerseys uh the indigenous representation jerseys uh but uh I, I, and so i actually am going to sort of double back and agree with brad fitler that there should be a home but i would like to see sort of a more formal arrangement of, of jerseys where you have a home kit and a away kit and an indigenous kit right uh, and but you do only wear the home kit when you're home and the away kit when you're away uh, it's sort of more like the nfl i'd actually really like to see that i think that'd be really cool um so everyone knows what jersey is going to be worn and then when we have representation it doesn't necessarily need to be a whole new jersey it could maybe be a patch on the jersey or something or signage around the grounds and things like that media during the week and everything like that i think that would be really really cool or something like on socks bands love, and things like that yeah, i love the socks idea i honestly i've done socks in, in previous clubs at, at back at home where we've been yeah. like cancer socks and they were just big purple ones so you see every team running out like that it was fantastic yeah I think stuff like that, I, I think uh, for sure you want to keep the jerseys sort of sacred and have the pride in playing in the jersey, but also I think the NRL should use its platform for spreading awareness for things like this mental health awareness, which is I think would be a fantastic initiative. And it's great to have the, the players be sort of leading the charge in that and actively speaking about it because that is one of the things that's always brought up with mental health is people don't like to speak about it. But it's very good that, um, in this instance, the players and the former players are leading the charge on it. Um, and there's quite a few ex-players that have talked about their mental health struggles while playing the game. And I know a sort of a common response always to athletes saying they're struggling with it. Uh, not so much in Australian sports anymore, but I do see this a bit um, as an NFL fan when NFL players talk about it, is, oh, they're so rich, they make so much money, what problems could they possibly be having and i think your segment last time was really excellent on covering what what problems people do uh face with that and yeah i think that money people think money solves all of life problems and it certainly does make things easier but it doesn't solve everything and um you know rather than tearing people down for saying that they're struggling we should be uh supporting them you know because at the end of the day uh, and we, we saw this a lot with Simone Biles when she pulled out of the Olympics because she just uh, was mentally 
uh, struggling with it. Um, and a lot of people backlashed, had a lot of backlash on her. Um, but we should be supporting people uh, in those in those instances rather than tearing it down. Because at the end of the day, as a random fan out there, how the fuck does it affect you if an athlete's out there saying they're struggling mentally and they're not going to play? Oh, okay, so your team is, is missing a player. Okay, deal with it. You know, yep. sports are more than one one player. Even in individual sports with the Olympics, like, okay, Simone Biles isn't competing how often were you supporting gymnastics before the Olympics, right? <laughs> yeah. What are you piling on her for? Are you really that upset that maybe America might miss out on a gold medal? Or are you just keen to, to bash someone else to make yourself feel good about yourself because you're struggling with your own things? And I think if people took... that That's all for the thing. The surface thoughts people immediately act on and speak out. Think before think before you speak. There's a good quote um, from a from a... TV series I, uh, I used to watch, but it's now, but it's been used in lots of other places, and it's that uh, everyone's got one mouth but two ears, so you should listen twice as much as you speak, um, which is kind of ironic for us to be saying on a podcast where we're talking the whole time. But <laughs> I think that's that's key is that you should listen twice as much as you speak, and uh, the world is made up of seven billion people, and there's one person cannot be ascendant above all others and so we should be listening to others and hearing their perspective on things and immediately saying the first thing that comes to your mind without some introspection and reflection is not a healthy habit 100 percent, and uh, it's a it's a bit of a i guess a rude awakening for new zealand fans as well with the stuff that's probably been said about um ian foster and i know julian Sevilla came out and, and made a post about it kind of ripping everyone out yeah. saying that's Ridiculous, and it is like you know there is a point to it. Yeah, New Zealand, the All Blacks aren't going well, and when we say aren't going well, they're still winning it above sixty percent. So it's harsh to say they aren't going well. But again, yeah. as 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 what's expected, just because you're not getting what is expected, doesn't mean that I can guarantee you. Even Foster's trying his hard out to. He doesn't want to go out there and lose games. It's not what his plan is. But uh, yeah, I just think yeah, there are some what's, people that needs to take a time from. And what's I think sad about a lot of this and a lot of sort of social commentary. On things, and this will lead into, I think, our next talking point as well, is that a lot of times people post stuff or comment stuff online, not because they even actually believe what they're saying or they truly, really hate someone or, or want to see someone fired. It's because they want to get likes, they want to go viral because they think it's an opportunity to, to get rich because they see other people that have gone viral make money, or it's just the, the dopamine you get from seeing people liking your post. And that's as someone who's on social media, that is a huge problem with social media is that um, a lot of people get a kick out of just getting likes. And what gets like is controversial or funny things where you're, you're bashing someone and you find creative ways to insult someone. That There's a huge internet subculture genre th theme of creatively insulting or bashing someone is, is applauded and rewarded. Um, and, you know, there, there, you have to recognize that there are limits uh, to that as well. You know, there there are times to to knock people down a peg who are a bit on a high horse, especially in Australia. We infamous for tall poppy syndrome here in Australia, yeah. and people getting too big for their boots, which at some points is good. I think it leads to a culture where uh, how accountable? At least we try. To, exactly, exactly right. Um, and a lot of other countries, you don't see that where there are different. And it's, it's different classes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, whereas in Australia, there's not, you know, at least we like to think there's not huge, like major class division. I know from the time I spent in England, there's definitely class division there between posh and non-posh people. Like you can, there is just that um, divide, right? As much as it can get broken down. Um, but yeah, there's this huge internet theme of, of breaking people down and doing so uh, in a funny way. Uh, and... You know, at some points it's funny, and but it go it can go too far. It's like it's like anything; it can go too far. So, hundred oh, um, percent. I think that definitely needs to be reined in a bit. I I, I think it's going to bring us into sort of our, our next point, or at least some points I'd like to make about our next talking point, which is, I believe, Junior Paulo. Yeah, Junior Paulo has uh, decided he is going to play for Samoa at the Rugby League World Cup, which I think is fantastic news for the sport yeah. of rugby league. Um, I do, I do, I again, not his fault at all in the timing. I want a more 
structured way of finding these, this news out rather than him having to come to the media himself and saying he's going to play for his own country. Like, again, he shouldn't yeah. have to do that. Um, I feel like it should be more structured. But, again, I'm I'm more than happy um, that he's decided that, made that decision. Um, and, again, I remember when Tal Malolo went decided against the Kiwis um, and decided to play for Tonga. And it was heartbreaking as a Kiwis fan because I thought that was a we were never going to win or beat the Aussies again. I've, I've obviously got renewed hope that the, the Kiwi board and, and New Zealand Rugby League has got a plan and a guy named Joey Manu came about, so that made me feel less sorry about myself. But it is the way mm. the way it's done needs to be improved. Other than that, I think it's great. Uh, as many who want to go and play for... Uh, the country of heritage should go, and it's going to make this World Cup a hell, hell of a lot more exciting than what it was going to be with just probably New Zealand versus Australia in the final, maybe England. Yeah, and uh, as as we've just talked about in this podcast, we had it a few weeks ago in the wake of uh, Origin 3, a whole bunch of talk about uh, the, the players for the Blues that had also said they were going to play for Samoa. Uh, Luai and, and To'o not notable amongst them and the, the online backlash that was uh, present there for people saying that um, you know oh how can they be as passionate as Queensland obviously it's different I mean Josh Papali'i one of the Maroons best is is committed for Samoa as well uh, and I believe Tino is is looking to to not rumors be, are flying be yeah. Selected for Australia. yeah so I don't th- and Jeremiah Nanai as well so yeah. It's not unique to the Blues, and I think it's great. Now, there's a whole lot of online stuff about, like, our oh, State of Origin's a joke now. Um, it used to, it used to be about selection for the Kangaroos, like it was a trial for selection to the Kangaroos. Where's that written? Look, if, if that's what it is, then that should be written down. It should be, if you play State of Origin, you have to be eligible for the Kangaroos. If that's something they want to implement, fine. But until it's implemented, stop bashing these players for... Going for playing for their cultural heritage, you can be equally as proud to be a New South Welshman or Queenslander as you are of being Samoan or James Tedesco, Italian. He represented Italy before. Uh, Mitch Moses represented uh, Lebanon. You know, there's lots. We we are, as I said before, and I said on this podcast, we're a nation uh, of immigrants. The vast majority of people in this country are not Indigenous Australians. We've come either from the First Fleet or uh, you know, uh, European immigration, we send ways of Asian immigration, Pacific in- immigration, African immigration, Middle East, all over the world, right? People come here, all right, because they, they want to make a, a better life for themselves. And I've seen a lot of people in this post saying, oh, yeah, why would he, why would they want to represent the country that's just, that's given them so much? That's, there's not, it's not at all about, fl- um, putting a middle finger up to Australia, being not grateful for the opportunities that you've got here. But at the same time, you you can have pride in where you come from as well at the same time, um, and I, I really dislike that we're falling into this sort of American um, nationalist patriot, uh, over the top patriotism trap of being like you have to love your country so much and you have to you have to do everything for your country kind of thing like that. It's you know no no you don't you can love your country and you can be appreciative of the place you come from, but also play a sports game for a different country. But also you can also ca- call out the things that are wrong with your country as well. Otherwise, you're gonna, we're going to go the way of America, and I don't think anyone here wants that because, no. fuck me, that's a hellhole at the moment. <laughs> uh, and, and again, there's a lot of online uh, comments, like just flippant little snarky comments about like, um, you know, they're shit anyway, or they lost the Blue Series, who gives a shit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many different things about... Uh, uh, about the players that um, I can see why a lot of players aren't on social media because why the fuck would you be when everyone's out there yeah. to, to be a critic of you? Um, but at the end of the day, it's great for international rugby league, which is necessary to grow the game, which will put more money into the game, which will make growing the game easier and better and we'll get a better product at the end of it. So it's like, it's so counterintuitive. People yeah. are arguing against this. Like yeah. it's just 100%. so counterintuitive. It's it's that was what I was having a little laugh about before. It's like okay, yeah, they're pulling the middle finger to Australia. It's like okay, we, they can't play yeah. in the narrow anymore, and we'll see how that goes. Watching a whole bunch of Kiwis and Aussies run around <laughs> and not play and yeah. not have any Pacific players, like it's just a joke, man. Like you know, like if 
someone who's Fijian descent, you know, never grew up in Australia, but now plays in the NRL and then got citizenship. Like, it's like Australia hasn't given him much, you know. Like, like, like he's come across because of how good of a talent he is, not because of, you know, Australia's got anything to do with it. It's just we've got the competition yeah. for it. So it's just, yeah, it is a joke. And, um, but, yeah. And another thing is, as well I want to say about that, my grandparents on my mum's side are immigrants to this country from, from Malta, right? And I think to say that, oh, this country, you know, oh, they why would he want to represent the country that's given him so much? I think is really rude and disrespectful to the efforts that immigrants put in when they come to this country to make something of themselves. Because here in Australia, you do not get handed anything for free. And that is one of the, I, I think any Australian would not be happy to say that, yeah, this country just gives stuff out for free to anyone. You have to work bloody hard to get something here and especially immigrants like my grandparents came here my granddad worked his ass off in in an auto shop and he made something of himself through um his hard work and effort my grandmother she worked as a cleaner at the high school that my mum went to like she was the school cleaner and things like that as well and they were uh, insulted and attacked when they were here called all sorts of names back when everyone hated on uh wogs and people of uh back when people of U- european non-anglo descent when they came here were considered the nasty immigrants you know and we've uh, that's the thing about australia we've always we've got a different flavor of immigrant to pick on every couple of decades you know and back in their day it was it was uh mediterranean background uh immigrants and so to say oh it's like giving a middle finger to the country that's given them so much no and you look at papali'i you look at to'o what do they do when they get their money? They give back to their parents because their parents were the ones that gave them everything because their parents came here and worked their asses off to make something of themselves and to contribute to society. So I think it's a little bit disrespectful to the elder generations. And of course, when you see those elder generations work for you, you want to give back to them. And what's a way to give back to them? Representing your culture and showing them that you are still proud of where you came from. 100%. Couldn't agree more. So, I mean, good news, I think, for International Rugby League. Good news for a World Cup that's yeah. coming up at the but end Samoa of this year. The Samoa team looks scary. It does. Look can, scary. Papali'i it, and Paolo as the the two props, far out. That's scary. Yeah, and you got Tino at 13, Nanai in a second row, and that's not to have anyone who was just selected as well. So, I think Marty Tapao yeah. can come off the bench. You know, that's a. But it, it'll be lots fantastic of, when I watch boys. the Kiwis put 60 points on them. Um. <laughs> Uh, I think you've got the next point, Mr. Junior yeah, Ramone. From, Killing yeah, it. Yeah, from one junior to the other. To the other. <laughs> junior Ramone uh, signed his extension this week and immediately rewarded the Dragons for their faith in him, scoring three tries and setting up the fourth uh, for St. George in a two-point loss to Canberra. Thank you, referees. Uh, <laughs> um, even though it ended St. George's season, it immediately showed why they signed him. So... Um, I think sometimes that's that, it's that's not always the case when the player signs a big contract. They don't necessarily <laughs> go out and have a big game like that. But I think I think what it is is it's confidence boosting for him. He needed that security behind him. Like okay, I'm set here. I've I've got a contract for next year and the year after. I don't need to be in my head as as much. I can just go and play my game, which he did. And that's what you. You, know, you love a good ball running six in the NRL. Look at Cam Munster, uh, for example, Jerome Luai. He made plays with his legs as well as with his hands. Incredible stuff. And I just wanted to highlight that as a St. George fan about what an incredible effort that was for a young kid. I mean, yeah, we, we talked about it ages ago when I said he last year, I think it was probably, uh, he reminded me a bit of Benji in that right, right footstep, showed a little bit on yeah. uh, on the weekend. So that was really good to see. I mean, him and if Deadly. you can sign, sign Hunt again... Um, that's a that's a massive combo. Yeah. The way Hunt played uh, again on the weekend with his his kicking game is just probably the best in the league. I must say, like it is unreal. Yeah. Um, on to the NFL preseason now. It doesn't really matter, obviously, the results, but both of our teams won, like I said, and the Ravens Hell pushed yes. their streak up to 21 games, I think it was. Uh, Husey got to see a bit of Kenny Pickett. I got to see a bit of Desmond Ritter. Uh, and then Drake London got I saw got a lot injured. of good things. <laughs> I saw a lot of good things, including rookie camp sensation George Pickens, wide receiver selected in the second round. Incredible, Some incredible, spectacular catches uh, on the weekend, including his touchdown catch with a little toe tap in the end zone and pay tribute to former Steelers wide receiver Antonio Brown by doing his now viral <laughs> Instagram TikTok dance uh, in the end zone. Um, but yeah, Man, they, Steelers really hit a, a good one with him. Um, 
all three of the quarterbacks, the Steelers, uh, have to have a chance to start, uh, played really well. So I, I think, uh, yeah, Mike Tomlin's got a good problem on his hands in that he's got three viable quarterbacks, at least from what we've seen from this preseason game. We've got two more to go. Um, but yeah, liked what I saw from all three of them. Uh, they all have their sort of different uh, strengths. You know, Mitch Trubisky, veteran, won playoff games, more mobile than Mason Rudolph, who's got of, probably more of a bigger pocket presence and a more of a cannon able to get the ball downfield. And Kenny Pickett, while he's raw, he's probably the most mobile of the three. He's lacking sort of an experience. I see Trubisky as sort of a little bit more developed version of him, but Pickett's got a higher ceiling. I think that's what the Steelers see the same. So I think Trubisky will wind up winning the starting job and uh, Pickett or Rudolph will be his, his backup. I think all three of them are good quarterbacks to have. Yeah, I think from my point of view, the the, 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 the football that I've watched has been fantastic. Um, the highlights, the, the plays, I haven't seen a lot of bad football. I watched, sat there and watched bits and pieces of games. So I'm excited for the season ahead. Like it, it, it's it's yes. really starting to become real, you know. Um, so yeah, um, I think we'll get more and more, obviously, when the games actually matter, um, which isn't too yeah. far away. I think it's, what is it, it must be under... 28 I've days. got a countdown somewhere yeah. here on my phone. Uh, 25 days. 25 days away to the kickoff. So, yes, expect over probably the next week we'll, we'll make some plans to do some, some more NFL things. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're not to see some more information on that. Uh, last point from the headlines. If you haven't been watching the EPL, uh, you wouldn't have seen what was probably the most disappointing se- uh, game uh, at four- 35 minutes of any football team in the history of the EPL where Manchester United went down 4-0 to Brentford in 34 minutes. Mm. Now, I um, was fantastically up for, for this <laughs> because it was the same time as the All Blacks versus South Africa. Um, and so I had... <laughs> I had the updates going in and it was just shock. Like they went down 1 0, and I was like, you know, that can happen to the best of teams. Then they went down 2 0, 3 0, 4 0. I had uh, Opta Sport on my phone next to me just watching the goals and it was a joke. Like, I, I, again, I, I don't know about you, but I come from the background where when we grew up, Manchester United was the team, the team. Like mm. everything was yep. Manchester United. Now it just it's an embarrassment. So it's I mean I, I think a lot of teams will be a lot of people will be enjoying seeing this because I can imagine they're very much like the Crusaders and you know the Patriots you know from had that had that big wins you know had a long dynasty and uh, are starting to crumble a little bit. So I imagine a lot of teams will be taking enjoyment, but it was just a I guess a just a lot. What is happening right now? Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I must say that uh, that that took my took my breath away from that that headline there. It's it's just incredible how many English football teams there are. You know, obviously the promotion relegation and the how many stadiums there must be across <laughs> the country that are capable of holding tier one events and things like that is pretty crazy. So it is, it's yeah, a special, it, uh, special it's definitely enjoyable and. Uh, it, it's again a sort of another nail in the coffin of the uh, Super League idea that was touted about last year, I believe, yep. uh, of the of the of the big six in in the EPL. Everyone's vulnerable, and we even saw it with uh, Liverpool where they tied their first game. Yep. So, uh, you know, anything's possible, and that's a good thing about the 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 EPL is that even when it it's uh, improbable and teams seem like they're always dominating, teams are always at the top, hardly ever losing games, it can still happen. 100%. Husey segment. Da, 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 da. Yes. Da, 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 da. Yes. So, what do you uh, got for d- us? A bit of a variation. A bit of a variation. Not hyperbolic headlines this week. Um, this week, I'll sort of explain the, the premise behind this afterwards. But this week, I've got something special. Uh, and it's called Things That Have More Integrity Slash Are More Trustworthy Than NRL Refs. So, Things That Are More Integrity Have More Integrity Slash Are More Trustworthy Than NRL Refs include a wet paper bag, the New South Wales Parliament, a treehouse built by a dad who has no handyman experience whatsoever and had a few too many last night down at the tab, the plot of the movie The Happening, that marketing job that someone you knew from high school who you haven't talked to in seven years hits you up about, a house that has sustained flood damage, a house that has sustained fire damage, the straw house that the first pig built to keep out the big bad wolf, the wood house that the second pig built to keep out the big bad wolf, the Melbourne Storm salary cap team, the New England Patriots ball inflation specialist, Deshaun Watson in a massage parlor, Robert Kraft in a massage parlor, the Manly Seven, the consistency at the Parramatta Eels, Scott Morrison, 
The bottom half of a hamburger bun where the hamburger is just overloaded with fillings and for some reason they used a really watery tomato sauce below all the fillings and the moisture is just being pressed down into the bun and it's really soggy and falls apart after one bite. <laughs> that one button on my jeans that I swear still fit even after someone put them through the dryer when they clearly say not dryer safe, not to name any names, Connor, and I've eaten an entire halal snack pack. A torrent from LimeWire that says unreleased Eminem track, never heard before, that I downloaded when I was 11 and then installed a Trojan onto my PC. Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin... FIFA's World Cup selection process, Clive Palmer and the United Australia Party, and of course, Paul Kent. <laughs> so, that is my list of things that have more integrity slash are more trustworthy than NRL refs. And what inspired this list was, of course, the end of the Dragons <coughs> Raiders game, oh. which concluded in what should have been a penalty, but was not given a penalty, which in in an open secret was clearly a makeup call from the, the, week, the round 16 match between uh, the two teams. Now, Definitely a penalty. Everyone's agreed it should be a penalty. I don't know about you, Luke, but I've been taught since I was very young that one of the key tenets of life is that two wrongs don't make a right. Also coming out from the, the biblical verses that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, etc., etc. The list goes on about where you make a mistake, another mistake is not going to fix that first mistake, right? So just because... The rest feel like or were under pressure that they made a bad call in the original, uh, the first matchup between the Dragons and the Raiders. Doesn't mean that you should call it differently in this round to make up for your previous mistake. Just call what's in front of you, right? And we've seen some terrible calls from the NRL refs uh, over the last few weeks, particularly the end of the Cowboys and Tigers game as the most stark example of this, which the NRL has come out and said it was a bad call, but there's no way they're ever overturning the result because of the entire can of worms, the possibility that that opens up. Um, I thought the Tigers had a creative argument in that, in that they said it wasn't just a mistake, that they should never have been in the position to make a mistake in the first place, et cetera, et cetera. There is just so much wrong with the NRL refs. I'm getting sick and tired about talking about them. Everyone's saying the bunker this, the bunker that. It's not just the bunker. It's the on-field refs as well. We saw it in origin. No level of this game is immune from it. And something needs to change. Something needs to be fixed. Now, by the same token, by the same token, attacks on referees and their personal lives, which I think Ben Cummins talked about this week, uh, his experience in the wake of the grand final where he made a mistaken call um, against the Canberra Raiders for the Sydney Roosters, the infamous six again, that wasn't a six again call. It is never acceptable to threaten someone's life, let alone threaten their children, send hateful messages, blackmail, threatening messages, anything like that, not acceptable. It is totally fair to hold someone accountable for poor performance. It is not acceptable to personally attack them. I want to say that now, and I, no one misinterpret that for me. That being said, if anyone else in any other profession was as inconsistently performed poorly and didn't do what their role said they should be doing as professional sports referees seem to do, they would be fired instantly. If, if I got as many things so important, so wrong as NRL referees do, I would be unemployed. There has to be a certain standard that uh, people are held accountable to. And I think taking people off for... One week is not enough. I recognize as well, in the heat of a game, in the heat of a moment, sometimes you you make mistakes. But when there's a pattern of it, when there's a pattern of these makeup calls and things like that, something needs to be done. I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have the, all the answers. I'm just here as a sports fan saying, I'm not a fan of this. So please explain. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting. Like You'd think rugby union is a harder sport to referee than rugby league. Mm. Let's be honest. The amount of rules, everything like that. And I'm not one to say that all rugby union refs are great. But I tend to think we have less issues with rugby union refs than we have in the NRL refs. And I don't know if there's another sport out there that seems to have the issue that NRL was having. Even I would be interested to know Super League if they're having the same issues. Um, because it just seems to be that there's constant discussion about the refs, and I just I know like in rugby a ref can really take make a decision and and left and right, but I I think I don't know if there's been more money put into it, and they've got the availability to put more money into it, like World Rugby versus uh, uh, Rugby yeah. League, and like we've said, this is maybe this is the international game, you know, like our all referees are World Rugby referees. It's not 
you know, an NRL referee or anything like that. So even Super Rugby all come under World Rugby referee. So I don't know, and I guess there's always that that level you're always trying to get to when you're a referee. Yeah. In, in Super Rugby, you're, you've got to go to the internationals, and then when you get to internationals, it's to be selected for World Cups. So I don't know, maybe it's just the fact that they haven't quite got, you know, the NRL and State of Origin is the highest you can get, and you've only got three games of that a level a year, and, and then it's just, yeah, I, I haven't got the answers either. I, it's just interesting. I think what we see in World Rugby compared to, say, the NRL is that what we have an issue with more in rugby union is the laws of the game themselves rather than the referees. Now, maybe we have some problems with the referees um, interpretations of those laws and taking them too literally, but I don't think we have as much of an issue with the referees calls themselves. Like I know obviously uh, in rucks and things like that, there is some that, that that can really make a good referee from a bad referee, but I don't think those calls are as it's not as it's not the main gripe we have with with rugby because I think that's not at the worst standard ever. Whereas rugby league, it's no calls and things like that, or calls phantom calls uh, and things like that, where it's just plain wrong. It's not like a wrong interpretation; it's just wrong yeah. kind of thing, or something yep. should have been called. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's sort of the primary difference and why. Um, we see that in, in world rugby, the focus is more on the laws of the game themselves rather than the referees as individuals. Yeah, very cool, very cool. I like that. So that was that was Hughes's. <laughs> yes, was, that's that's my uh, yeah. It was things that have more integrity slash are more trustworthy than NRL refs. Um, do, do you want the list again? Do you want me to run through? No, it all don't again? go for it again. You'll make me laugh again. That was good. Uh, that was bloody good. Um, yeah. Okay, Luke's top five. We're on to mm. this again. Last week it was top five things killing rugby. We're still on rugby, but what we are actually on this week is top five athletes I would not want to be running into on a rugby field or any type of field. Now, what this has come from is twice in two games within the first minute, Caleb Clark's knees have knocked a South African player out. And South Africans are well known for being one of the hardest bastards in the world. So... It's kind of given me a bit of inspiration. If I go across there, I probably don't want to see Caleb Clark running at me because his no. knees will probably end up putting me in hospital. So I've got the top five athletes I would not want to run into on the sporting field. At five, I've got a duo. It's Caleb Clark with the bus Julian Sevilla. Would not want to be running into those guys. So, so num- sorry, just to, just, just to clarify, with, when you say me. top five a- athletes, yes. is it just rugby athletes or is this going to be from across all sports? From across all sports. Okay, cool. Cross all Sorry, sports, so. I just needed to clarify that. For, for Any sport that makes field. It obviously, uh, that makes it a harder list to crack then because there's some, some big boppers across world sports. That's, so. This is it, yes, yeah, exactly. Sorry for so. the interruption, but no, no, yeah, no, no, I needed no, no, to, no. I needed to yeah. know to, to the be people, able to you've, you've helped the people explain. So, yes, this is top five yeah. affluence I would okay. not want running into me on any sports field. So the first one's obviously a rugby field with Caleb Clark and Julian Savia. Second one, we go to the NFL and we're on a Astro turf. We're in Tennessee. I don't want to see Derek Henry running at me at any time, at any place. I'm probably running the other way. Number three, we bring it back to Australia, but it's a different sport. It's the NRL. I wouldn't want to be in North Queensland playing in Townsville and seeing Jason Talmalolo with a head of steam going straight at me. That man is a beast and uh, is probably at one point, especially when he was coming, the uh, Cowboys were eight, finished eighth and they went on that long run and Talmalolo was running over everyone and through everyone. Not a man I would like to see. Number two, this one for you, Husey, the original bus. Jerome Bettis, well, let's see, 5'11", 257 pounds of full fucking Big raw boy. body heat. Man, moving at me with pads on. I'm running the other way. I'm putting my head anywhere near that. And number one, the one, the only, the original number 11, Jonah Lomu. No way would I want to be looking like, I think it was Michael Catt, uh, in the English jersey getting run over because that is what would be happening. So those are the top five athletes I would not want to yeah. have running at me on a sports field. <laughs> can, I, can I offer a counter? Can yes. I offer a counter list? Send, send, send some okay. in my way. All right. So so quick. So this is my quick top five just off the top of my head. So forgive me if I, if I miss out uh, on any here. 
Uh, number five, I'm going to go from the NRL. Uh, Nelson Osofa Sola. <laughs> Big Nelson, basically. The amount... I mean, he's literally broken someone's jaw this season. Like, I mean, he. I, this is also... One, his body... But two, just how he plays. Like he's yeah. a dirty player. I just I wouldn't want him running at me either with me with the ball or him with the ball. Both are just as likely to end in me losing teeth or breaking a bone. <laughs> so he's my he's my number five. Number four, I'm going to put uh, Jerome Bettis. I agree with what you said there. Uh, just really really scary. Number four, I'm going to put uh, sorry. Number three, I'm going to put Jonah Lomu. Uh-huh. Right, I'm going to put number th- three uh-huh. Jonah Lomu. Number two. I, this is sort of an NFL heavy list for me, but number two, Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald. Just, uh, I, I see. Mean, I see what you're doing here. Yeah. Okay. See. Well, see. No, mine. Muscle. Mine's just focusing on them running at me, but I could see. Oh I yeah, him running at. I wouldn't want him with running ball at hand, me or me running at him. I'm thinking like yeah. again, we haven't seen Aaron Donald, but I get what you're trying to say here. Yeah. Either way, yeah. I am so confident. <laughs> either way, that I wouldn't want to get in his path. Yep. And my number one is. Perhaps the most violent player ever to put on a Steelers jersey, right? He looks he looks so scary. They gave him the nickname of the big destructive dude from the movie Friday, Debo number ninety two, James Harrison. Possibly caused more <laughs> concussions than any nice. other player in NFL league history. He has flipped people over his head and crunched their necks. He has knocked so many people out. He single-handedly ended Colt McCoy's career. He is the scariest person I have ever seen. If you've seen his insane training regime, he's not a tall dude. But every action, reaction, bonus action he does is purely to make his body stronger, harder, meaner, tougher than anyone else. If you've followed him at all on any social media... He is just the, he's the hardest person I think I've ever seen, <laughs> both mentally and physically. He's got these two massive revolvers that are bigger than my hands, right? <laughs> he goes out into the woods and just spends days there training. He has got the most insane treasure, training regimen of anyone I've ever seen. I would not want to be either running at James Harrison or James Harrison running at me <laughs> in any context, any field. If I had a brick wall between me and James Harrison, I would still fear for my safety. <laughs> That's how hard yeah. and scary he is. I am not scared of any other human being the way I am scared of James Harrison. Fair enough. I will definitely give you that one. Uh, that yeah. he is a scary motherfucker. Uh, the last point on the podcast today, I just wanted to discuss quickly the sporting landca- landscape in Australia slash the world, um, but particularly in Australia. Now, why this is a topic that's come up on the podcast is because I went to the Sydney Swans game against Collingwood uh, at the SCG on a nice Sunday afternoon, um, beautiful sunset at all. And I kind of go, shit. Like, obviously, there's a lot of talk about AFA, AFL in Australia. They get the crowds here. And I never really understood why. You know, a New Zealander's never really going to understand why because the sport's fucking stupid. But it's stupid in a good way mm. because the ball's in play. There's a lot of excitement. The skills they put in there, the you, you sit there and they you can you literally use, like, the whole field – and within 10 seconds, from two kicks, bang, bang, you've used the whole field, like a whole cricket-sized field. It's constant. I was like, it's a pretty bloody good sport. Don't get me wrong. So what I have kind of started to think is, now I'm understanding why when rugby started to go the way it did, it struggled. Because there's amount of opportunities in sport in Australia, the amount of sports, the amount of... I guess, ways to play, the amount of support that gets thrown behind sports. And let's just start making a list. Let's go AFL, obviously, pretty top dog with with crowds and stuff. Then you've got rugby league. You've got rugby. You've got football. You've got cricket. Let's not lie that the hockey team, um, the Kookaburras, just won their seventh gold medal in a row or something like that. So Mm. field hockey. I mean, then you've got swimming, you know, any tennis. other Olympic sport. Tennis, again, you, you hold a, t- golf. a tennis. A golf, Motor you've got sports. great golfers. It just goes, I can see why there's such a diluted, you know, 
sport here and when things do bottom out I can see why they bottom out when you struggle to get talent there as talent's going away from this sport to that sport and you look at a sport like rugby union that is well known I feel like for its injuries the the, the type of people in Australia who are playing it are normally private school players so when there's injuries and, and parents are a bit smarter you know this isn't NF, uh, NRL where Again, I don't want to call them like you know, like not prison rugby or anything like that. But like you know, it is you're mentally stronger. The kids who come from that are normally coming from quite aggressive backgrounds. You know, already you know are wanting to, mm. something there for that contact and stuff. So are ready to go and put their body on the lines. Where you go, rugby is a bit different. You then start to see AFL's penetration into those private schools. You're starting to see NRL yep. penetration doing the same thing. Um, I just go now the the opportunity. Like when you look at. New Zealand, and you look at the sporting landscape there, it's rugby union or football, you get a bit of basketball, and again, we didn't even mention basketball there, but those are the two main sports, and there's been a big, I guess, push towards football when I was there, we went to the 2010 Football Cup at college, this is where I'm putting specifically, and even outside of it, where you used to have, you know, four or five 15s, and you know, six, seven top 11s, um, it, it kind of changed to where we were struggling to get four 15s and we'd have three 15s, so you'd have first, seconds, thirds, and you'd have it going to, god damn if you'd, you'd stop doing seventh, 11s, and it was they'd started the alphabet because they didn't know if, you know, the, the 11th, 11th just sounded a bit stupid, so it just to me was like, it was a bit of a, an eye-opener going to the AFL on Sunday and going like, man, I can see why Rugby Union here has so much competition, I can see the... Yep. The content that you can put out with sport in this country is just insane. So, you know, like you said, you had motorsport, you have a, 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 a Grand Prix, you have a tennis open, you have these AFL games in Victoria, you have an NRL game. I can see why it's such a struggle for rugby if they don't put the right content mm. out there, if they don't have the right product there, if, if the sport, I can see why the NRL was continuously adapting now. It's just, I think we're going to have a very different sporting landscape in 50 years for the Australia. I don't know how it's going to turn yeah. out, but I just think it's going to be very different. An Australian perspective, I, hit me on it. Yeah, so I think that's a, those are all really good points you made. And, uh, and what it is, really, is, is propaganda. It's marketing. It's business adaptation for a sporting world. And I think you're absolutely right that the heritage of rugby union is sort of a private school boy thing. And it comes, it even stems from a whole division between rugby union and rugby league, where rugby league was the working class type of rugby because they couldn't afford to just play as amateurs because they didn't come from a wealthy background like the rugby union heritage did. So rugby union has always been slow to adapt. They've been tradition and high band. And we've seen it even in our discussion of the laws of rugby union and why it's slowing the progress of the game as well. Uh, but you look at AFL and what it's done, it's marketed itself to the lower age groups. And same with soccer as well as safer alternatives. Now, AFL is one of the most dangerous sports you can play. Contact from all sides of the field, a lot of jumping and falling uncontrolled to the ground, jumping on other people, a lot of head injuries and stuff. But they, they just they, what they did is they marketed themselves towards a younger audience and say it's a good way to get kids out there fit and moving because that's, that's sort of one of the more primary things that's on a parent's mind is how do I keep my child active you know there's a lot of talk about childhood obesity is uh, it was at a crisis point a few few years ago uh, and AFL and soccer really pitched themselves as the the healthy alternatives as a good way to keep kids running and moving every sport has got its own injury problems I think AFL is probably has some of the most injuries uh, of all the sports because of the reason I just described all the different contact points and everything. Soccer's more probably lower body uh, injuries than anything else that could really actually be quite serious a- a- as well. But but I think Rugby Union and Rugby League have sort of, or Rugby Union at the very least, has sort of felt more comfortable. Like we'll always have our stable of players coming through. We don't really need to put that much effort into it. And I think they've really lost out there. They had, they saw themselves having the advantage of the Wallabies, maybe only behind the cricket team, um, but probably for most of Australian history, has been the premier Australian sporting team. Has been the thing that we held ourselves up as a measuring stick against the the rest of the world, right? That's been what everyone's gotten behind and supported is the Wallabies. Now, they've seen themselves probably supplanted by the cricket team and the Socceroos, right? I think the one thing that Rugby Union has going for it 
and NRL have going for it over the AFL is that they are truly international games. Is that that's where they could see a lot of their path of progress is growing the game internationally, and that's where people might gravitate more towards NRL and rugby union is that you get a chance to represent your country. Um, AFL has done a really smart thing of building the game internally. I just, I don't think that they'll be able to grow the game internationally. And I think that's the only thing that would see rugby union and NRL survive is that you've got a chance to represent your, your country there. And you asked me a few, uh, podcast episodes ago, if I was in charge of rugby union Australia and we got this huge influx of money from the world cup, what would I do with it? And I said, straight away, youth development, right? You've got to stem and then reverse the flow of where AFL and soccer are coming in as the the healthy alternatives, right? Um, And it's going to be a hard job to do because there is the the bad reputation that rugby and and things like that have got. Fortunately, they don't have as bad of a reputation as like American football does, which is, uh, uh, but that sport is so massive in America and there's so many people in America that I don't think that's ever going to slow down and because of the same amounts of money involved in it as well however that's where you need to target is you need to target those younger ages and that also it also needs to be the safety measures also need to be put in place there where maybe for for kids playing the game it's mandatory to wear headgear or something like that and maybe that's something that rugby should look at as a whole you know nfl evolved from its early stages of you know minimal protection to then wearing headgear to wearing helmet to wearing leather helmets to wearing the full concussion helmets they have now they're even adapting still in training camp they've got to wear those guardian caps now for people that are in frequent high contact situations so adapting the game to learn from science to make it safer to play is what the is what nrl and rugby union need to do now they've got the advantage there as i said of being able to represent your country at that level, but they also have the advantage of they've got an existing thing of headgear being part of the game. So I think more more propaganda and marketing is what's needed yep. at the end of the day. So what's needed is more business and less sport in one way. The second thing is what we talked about the other week is you need to change the game a little bit to make it more accessible for viewing. Now, the NRL has done that with the six again rules and things like that. So the, I think the NRL and Peter Volanders has done a good job in, in that front. Now, they haven't gotten a perfect for sure, but I think they've gotten significantly more right than wrong. And the NRL, for me, is more entertaining to watch now. I feel like there is more excitement about the NRL uh, now. I'd love to see the viewing numbers in the stadium, attendance and things like that. Uh, but also, I, I think we, we need to develop more like you said, more smaller stadium experiences to that builds up the hype of going to the games. Like you want to go to a game where there's a, where there's a big crowd there and, and it's enjoyable to be part of something like that uh, rather than these big stadiums that aren't getting filled, save those big stadiums for the finals and things like that. Now there's all sorts of deals and money and whatever in place. We don't have all the answers. We're not experts. We're not involved in the, in the logistical different levels of this thing. So our solution isn't going to be a perfect one. We don't have a full detailed plan because we don't get paid to have a full detailed plan. We don't have access and things like that. But there are steps that they can take. I don't think you pass uh, rugby union is doomed. <laughs> oh, 100%, 100%. I don't think rugby league and and it, I think rugby league's on a good track. I think rugby union needs to start developing themselves on a good track. And I think there there are some steps being taken in in that regards. Um, I think especially uh having players speak up about things like what Michael Hooper did with his mental health struggles and things like that, making more personalities out of the players is a good way to go about it again as well. There's lots of things that they can do. Um, and until AFL develops internationally, I think there will always be a place for rugby union here in Australia, but at what level remains to be seen and it needs adaptation for sure. Yeah, I mean, a couple of good points I think you put in there. Obviously, the Wallabies, like you said, is is the golden standard, and that's why having winning that World Cup is probably quite important for what's what we're going to see at least over the next 10 years. Youth was an interesting point. Like, I feel like it would be a lot easier to take the contact out of AFL and keep the same sport. Like, you could do yeah. lots still with AFL, and you could do that right up to, you know, 13, 14, 15. They could still probably be playing without a lot of contact and, it, and it's not going to affect yeah. the game too much whereas rugby union when you get to those 13 14 it, it, it kind of has to be tackle you or else you're playing touch um so interesting but i do think like like um 
New Zealand's tried to adapt it with they have to tackle below the waist, just trying to keep it as safe as possible. But yeah, yeah. interesting. Headgears, Japan, it's a well-known thing in Japan that all kids playing rugby have to play in headgears, um, and even college kids up to a certain age, I think up to 16, have to play with headgears. Um, but yeah, mm. I mean, lots of lots of interesting kind of, I think, points there and, and, and interesting thoughts on where rugby and AFL and, and all of these sports can fit into the landscape in Australia. But I just, yeah, it was just an interesting... Going to that game, I was like, man, there is a lot of sports opportunities here. Yeah. And you know what's great with things like headgear? This is just an idea off the top of my head. Is it's a good way for... Because you've got the rest of your uniform all the same, but the, your headgear can be personal. Like, there's never been... Uh, like, you have to have a headgear with the same standard. So unlike NFL, where everyone's helmet has to be exactly the same... You could put a bit of personality into your own headgear. So you could encourage kids to get a headgear and color it in themselves. Or they could buy a headgear of their favorite player or something like that. Um, or of like Wallabies colors or something like that. Or of their super rugby team, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you've got lots of different ways that you can use that. Use that as a marketing tool and things like that as well. So there's opportunities there to 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 adapt the game in in and purpose things for more than one purpose. Multi-purpose ways of growing the game. So... You know, you have safety, earning more money by producing headgear as well, and you uh, making it like a creative opportunity for the kids as well, and everything like that. So there's 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 levels to it, and I'm sure that that's just one idea. But there's so many ways that it can be improved, um, and I think you know, at some point, perhaps you know, if the, if world rugby isn't adapting the laws of the game uh, fast enough for Australian purposes. Uh, then Australia should look to to have, and, and I think Sansa does a good job of. It's a it's a good alliance, but adapting those rules to for Super Rugby and lower level rugby to um, to make the game more accessible. And we've we've seen it with like the twenty minute red card and stuff like that. I think more needs to be done in that direction. More energetic change. I think yeah. a higher pace. It's the whole thing with rugby is essentially we need to pick up the pace. Yep, totally agree. And it's sort of, I, I, sorry, I'm going on again at this again, but it, it goes into sort of the, the changing social and cultural values of the day of today, which is there's a lack of patience generally. I mean, the whole thing with social media is we want instant gratification. We want things that are faster. We don't want to be waiting for things as much. We want, um, we want constant stimulation. And also when you're paying good money for a ticket for a game, you don't want to be there watching players stand around. You want to see them playing the game. So 100%. it's all of that adds up. It's a, it's changing world and sport needs to change with it or it'll go the way of tug of war in the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> As you famously said before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, excellent. it's always crazy to me that tug of war was an Olympic sport. Olympic sport. Right. And that's what, that's what I always think about is like, we think about sports and we think, Oh, well sports are going to be around forever, but we've only got like a very recent history. We don't know what the history of sport can be because it's only a very recent thing. So, yeah, it needs we we don't know 100%. what can happen to sports. Definitely, I mean that's a, and that, and that's a crazy thing, you know. Some of these rugby clubs, you know, are less than a hundred years old, and you know now when when we look about professional rugby, that's only like you know thirty years old. It's like you start having conversations yeah. like that. It's like it's we aren't we we haven't been doing this for a long time. It's it's a f- relatively new product, you know. Like, gosh, yep. some some some. Businesses out there are much older than what professional rugby is. So it's interesting. It's going to be an interesting few years, I think, for rugby, especially in Australia and New Zealand. I think it's going to be an interesting few years for all the sport uh, in the next 10 years, the, re- the recovery from COVID and then how they mm. all manage the rest of the way they go for the next 10 years. So we'll be we'll be along for the ride and we'll be keeping you up to date. Definitely. So make sure you're always joining in, listening to this podcast. Other than that... It's been a big week. We get a week off from rugby next week, so NRL takes centre stage as we head to to finals time and expect a bit more NFL probably content from us then. 100%. I know I'm very excited for the NFL season. Definitely. Well, thank you for joining us yet again on another podcast on the Sports Booth channel, the Sports Booth team. We will speak to you next week. See you later. Peace.